Hello, everyone. Welcome to this uh, hour-long session, taking a pretty quick look at a, a complex topic, coupling and cohesion. Or perhaps a better title for this would be improving your software quality through good modular design. What I'd like to do is to start with a very significant question. What makes software bad? What makes bad software? Well, the answer is obvious. It's bad software engineers. But we need a more concrete answer from uh, a business perspective. So what I'd like to do is explore that very quickly by having a look at one very important concept. And that's the concept of value. Good software is software that gives us good value. Bad software gives us no value or, in fact, even worse, negative value. In this case, we're talking about value in the terms of return on investment. If I've invested time and or money into a software project, what do I want back from that? And I think we can split this two ways. The first way we'll look at it, possibly the most important, is from the customer's perspective. We want value, um, let's call it an extrinsic quality. The other way we can look at this is from the actual development organization's point of view, and let's call that intrinsic quality. We're going to focus predominantly on intrinsic quality today, but first let's just have a quick look at what we mean by value from the customer's perspective. I think our, our baseline answer has to be correctness. That is, our software must be compliant with the customer's specifications. If they give us a specification and we don't comply with it, the customer is going to feel somewhat aggrieved that they didn't get what they paid for. So we want as a bare minimum to deliver the specifications. Of course, more so than that, we want to be able to deliver software that not only works, but works reasonably well. It must not be fragile. Um, it must be reasonably robust. It must perform well. Software that doesn't meet some basic level of quality of service is going to be seen as something that is not as high value, is not as good quality to the customer as something that does meet these things. The other fundamental problem that we suffer with is customers will quite often tell us what they want, but not often what they need. Good software from a customer's perspective should solve a problem. It should take some pain away from the customer. It doesn't matter how compliant to the spec is if the customer doesn't get some business value from this, doesn't take their pain away. If there's something that they are still able to do even with the software in place, it's not seen as a good piece of software. Now, what about from the development organization's point of view? Fairly obviously, we want to make sure that our software is correct and it provides good extrinsic quality. But beyond that, we want software that we've invested time, money and effort into to have some, well, let, let's say reuse. I don't like the word reuse in general. Um, let's face it. Uh, all software is reusable. It doesn't evaporate once you have written it onto the hardware or programmed it into Flash. It's effectively infinite re infinitely reusable. So what we're really talking about here is software that if, well, no, when it goes wrong, we can fix it properly. Um, it can be reconfigured to provide different options for different customers and it can be extended. That is, we can add new features to it to satisfy existing customers or even new customers. This is what we mean by intrinsic quality. When I invest into software, I want software that can be extended and reused and delivered to customers again in the future. Today, we're going to focus much on intrinsic quality. Here's a good way of thinking about intrinsic quality. Um, what we have here is a graph showing the lifetime of a project from its first release until its last release, end of life, when it's taken out of um, use. 
For most software projects, they will have multiple releases between their first and end of life. We'll ignore the projects where they are just written once, delivered, and then never modified again. Um, for some projects, uh, thinking particularly here in terms of things like military projects and aerospace projects, that project lifetime could be 10, 20, 30, 40, maybe even 50 years. And that project will be updated and extended with new features throughout its life. On our y-axis, we have the time and or cost to actually add new features to this system. A very naive view of this time or cost to modify is it's a flat line. Given any particular feature or extension we're going to add, theoretically it shouldn't take any longer to add that new feature to the first or second release of software as it does somewhere near the project's end of life. Of course, the reality isn't like that. Um, talk to seasoned, experienced engineers and they'll start to chuckle at this graph. And they'll tell you that the reality is probably far more like this red curve. As a project goes on, it takes longer and longer to add that unit feature, whatever that may be. We, we call this um, feature of software, we call it architectural degradation, sometimes known as software rot. The individual lines of code don't fail. If statements don't stop ifing and for loops don't stop looping, but the architecture, the structure of the system starts to fail over time. Um, a lovely example of this comes from uh, a very good book by Groover and his team called uh, A Practical Approach to Large Scale Agile Development. This is a team from HP and to read the quote, as our architecture aged, we no longer had clean interfaces in the system. So when we changed one area of the code, we had no idea of the impact across the system. He's describing their architectural degradation of their system. We have a, a nice analogy that we use in Phoebus. Um, we call it architecture Jenga. Um, many people familiar with this game. Your architecture of when you first release or first build the project is like the beginning of the Jenga game. The Tower of Bricks is solid, it is robust, and it's very easy to make modifications. Modifications are moving the bricks. Every time you move a brick in the game of Jenga, though, it subtly changes the points of balance of the system. As the game progresses, the tower of bricks gets larger and larger and less and less stable. Now watch people playing the game. Instead of just randomly grabbing for a brick and modifying the system, they circle the tower, studying it. They carefully select one of the bricks and they make the smallest modification they can. And then they run away because they don't want to be the one that brings the whole tower collapsing down. This is exactly what's happening with your software architecture. People are making the smallest, most delicate modifications they can and then running because they don't want to be the one that brings the whole tower collapsing down. So if we go back to our original curve, can we improve this architectural degradation? Well, yes, we can. That's what this lecture is all about. Unfortunately, it doesn't come for free. We can flatten the curve, we can't make it completely flat, that's not possible in software. Um, but notice we now have to spend more money up front. The initial releases of the project cost more money. We're going to have to design in resilience, we're going to have to design in tolerance to change in our system. It's worthwhile we've got this graph up looking here. This red region on the board there, um, be careful of that. That is negative value to the software development organization. It costs more to build an intrinsic quality in that red zone. That is money that we would not recoup if we just churned it out and built the system as quickly and as cheaply as we could. Obviously, there is the green region there, a positive value. And hopefully, in any real system, that area of positive value will greatly outweigh the negative value. 
but it is still there. This is why it's such a difficult thing to sell intrinsic quality to project managers and engineering managers because upfront it has negative value. It is cheaper to not do it. And quite often the results, the benefits won't be seen for many releases and possibly many, many years. So how do we achieve this then? Well, we've just said it has to be designed into the code. This intrinsic quality is something you have to design in. You cannot easily add it to a system that has already been built. So let's take a simple example and explore some of these features. Uh, the system we're going to pick here, very simplistic, a camera stabilization system for an optical um, device. Now, this is based on a, a system I worked on many, many years ago, my first commercial software project, more than 25 years ago now. Um, this was for a drone aircraft. The camera can be stabilized in two axes of control. In our case, it was roll and pitch. Each axis can be driven independently, and the camera can be pointed by the operator at a point on the ground and provide a stabilized image. Now, this is not in any sense a full requirement set for this particular project, nor is it meant to be. That's beyond the scope of this presentation, just to give you an idea of what we're trying to achieve here. From an engineering perspective, what we might call the solution domain requirements, then there are a set of problems that this system has to solve for us in order to meet the customer requirements. So for example, we need to be able to sense the environment. We need to be able to sense where the camera is. How accurately do we need to do that? We need to be able to actuate and drive the camera. How precisely do we need to do that? We need to handle operator input, provide a user interface. And we also need to provide some level of stabilization. Now, each of those problems will have levels of unknown unknowns, things we don't know about. Some we may be very familiar with, some not so much. Now, requirements analysis and design and development is about isolating and removing those unknown unknowns. Let's assume that we've done that though, and we come up with a design for our system. Because this is a relatively complex system, a single module is not enough, so we've taken our system and broken it down into smaller modules. The dotted boxes on this diagram represent the problems we have to solve, and the solid boxes represent modules of software to solve that problem. For the purposes of argument, let's assume that this design is in fact correct. That is, it fulfills the customer requirements, it meets their qualities of service, and it fulfills their needs. So as far as we're concerned, we could ship this design. It is a correct design. However, we could possibly come up with an alternative design. Here is an alternative design. And once again, for the sake of argument, let's assume that this design is also correct. This leaves us with a problem. Is there one correct, completely right solution? Which of these designs is best? Which one do we go forward with? Which one do we implement? Well, some engineers will say, well, we'll go with the cheapest one. Um, in other words, we'll ignore all the intrinsic quality issues and just deliver the one that is cheapest. But even from this, it's quite difficult to work out which is the cheapest. So what we really want to do is pick the design that is not only correct, and if they're both correct, we want to pick the one that has the highest intrinsic quality. This then leaves us with a problem. How do I say which of these two designs has the higher intrinsic quality? We need some language that we can apply to this, some qualitative measures to say that one or other of the designs is more intrinsically higher quality than the other. And this is what the, the core of this presentation is all about. Let's have a look at some of these concepts of design quality. There are four of them. The two primary ones are known as coupling and cohesion. 
Now, coupling and cohesion are related to each other, and they're also related to two other concepts, encapsulation and abstraction as well. Together, these four concepts give us a language to explain which design has the stronger intrinsic quality. We're going to focus predominantly on coupling and cohesion today. Um, we'll bring in encapsulation and abstraction as we go through. Encapsulation is a way of improving coupling. Abstraction is a way of achieving better cohesion in our modules. So let's go through these things. Let's start with coupling. Coupling as a concept is a measure of the interdependency between modules in our system. So it's an external measure of design quality. What does interdependency mean? Well, some engineers take it to mean the number of connections between modules. If all of the modules in our system are connected to all of the other modules in our system, then we have high coupling. That's fairly obvious. What we don't see here is that interdependency can also happen where there are a small number of connections, but those connections are very complex. I think a better definition of coupling is the amount of state information that modules share. The more state information modules share, the higher their coupling is. So if we have a system where multiple modules are all sharing state information, we have high coupling. If we only have a connection between two modules, but they exchange a lot of state information, we still have high coupling on our system and we need to reduce it. Coupling is normally given as a spectrum. This isn't an absolute number. There are different types of coupling, some considered less desirable than others. Um, in this case, less desirable means a system has less flexibility, less extensibility, is more difficult to maintain. In other words, is less tolerant to change. Systems with the lower coupling tend to be more flexible, more extensible, easier to maintain, and more tolerant to change. So we're desiring lower coupling in our system. We want the lowest possible coupling we can get away with and still achieve our functionality. What we'll do is we'll go through these because many of these concepts are slightly difficult to understand um, and not explained very well. And sometimes there appears to be a lot of overlap between them. So we'll go through these terms, uh, uh, defining them, and then we'll move on. So we'll start at the worst possible case we can have. It's called content coupling. Uh, content coupling is also sometimes referred to as pathological coupling. I'll explain why in a moment. Um, content coupling occurs when one module, for example, reuses or jumps into or falls through into a subpart of another module's code. That's actually remarkably difficult to achieve in um, modern programming languages, but if you fall back to some of the lower level languages, C, and particularly assembler, these things are perfectly possible. Many coding standards actually say that a function should have a single point of entry and a single point of exit. These days, we tend to focus on the single point of exit, but actually content coupling also implies that a function could have multiple points of entry. For example, assembler labels that you could jump into to allow you to skip part of a function and not execute it. Um, actually, more likely in terms of content coupling is where one module can directly modify another module's private state information. That is, state information that should not be exposed. Uh, for those of you in the C++ world and Java world who are fans of getter and setter methods on your classes. Getter and setter methods indirectly expose private state. So you could argue that they are actually a form of content coupling and therefore should be avoided wherever possible. There's one third, even more extreme example, which is where one module actually modifies the source code of another module while it's running. 
Um, I've only heard of that in one place, and that was on the Space Shuttle flight control software. Not something I would recommend in commercial code these days. So content coupling is the worst possible case we could have. It's very difficult to achieve these days, but it's still out there. Let's move up a level to something that is still fairly bad in terms of coupling. It's known as common coupling. Common coupling is where modules share global state information. That is, all state information in the system is in a single place and all code shares all state information. Also known as global variables. They told you global variables were evil. This is why. They give you the high, one of the highest forms of coupling you can achieve in a, a system. Here's a, a more concrete code example. Here we have our read temperature function in one particular module. There is a get latest in degree centigrade in another module. Both of those modules share a global variable in the system. Now, it means that the read temperature module can change the state of the other module without its knowledge. Uh, this is bad in sequential code. Uh, it can be truly devastating in multi-threaded code where two modules running in separate threads of execution can change global variable at the same time, what we know as a data race condition. Common coupling then is generally considered a bad thing and we want to avoid it wherever possible. Um, surprisingly, it happens a lot, perhaps by the name global uh, common coupling. Let's make things a little bit better. This is closely related to uh, common coupling. External coupling is where two modules are bound together by the structure or format of a hardware device. For example, um, a GPIO port. Here we've got two software modules, hardware abstraction layer A and B, both controlling the same piece of hardware. It's very similar to common coupling. In this case, the only difference is we are referring to hardware. Hopefully you can see that this is likely to give us bad results if we are not very, very careful. Generally, we want a one-to-one -one mapping between driver software and the hardware that it drives. At this point, we move up the spectrum a little bit into code that isn't necessarily evil, but is probably best avoided. Something called control coupling. Two modules are control coupled if one module passes a flag or other signal to another module to say how to control its processing. So in this particular case, the input parser provides an action flag to the uh, transaction processor to say what action should be performed. Now, why is that bad? Why does that increase coupling? Well, if we take the transaction processor in isolation, it no longer has all the code it needs to perform its functionality. It has to have something on the outside telling it what to do in certain situations, which means the logic of what needs to happen needs to be captured in another module. If I want to use the transaction processor in another system, I also need to provide that logic to say when to update, when to create, when to read, and when to delete. That has to be unpicked from the system. So it's still not a desirable consequence. Next up, we have the, the very curiously named stamp coupling. People always get very confused about stamp coupling. I think it's a, a terrible name for it. Uh, there are several definitions out there of why it's called stamp coupling. My, my personal favorite comes from the good old days when we used to do document review with paper documents. When the document was sent for review, a large rubber stamp was used on the front cover, and that rubber stamp listed all of the people that could review the document. And you would tick off on the list who had to review the document, and the document would disappear off into the design office, never to be seen again. Why is this a bad situation? Well, over time, that stamp tended to get larger and larger as more people became involved in the review process. In the end, 
it became very difficult to know who was going to review the document and who wasn't. The same thing is true when we look at stamp coupling in modules. Stamp coupling occurs whenever two modules share data via a pointer to a structure, and more so when that structure has more information than either of the modules actually need. This particular example that's on the screen comes from some, a company that we worked with uh, recently, and every module in their system had to have access to this debug info structure. Now, the debug information structure had some common features like the module name, the module ID, the date, and the time. And then it would have a whole load of specific information for that particular module. Where was the problem in this? Well, every module needed its own default or a, its own debug information. So it would be added to the structure as the modules were added to the system. As the system grew, the debug structure got bigger and it became increasingly difficult to work out which of the elements in the debug structure were actually useful and which ones weren't. Um, at the time I spoke to this particular company, they had over 500 elements in their debug info structure, a vast number, which meant any new modules in the system, it was generally much easier to just add extra information to the end of the structure. So we got a sort of a, a runaway cascade of information in the system hundreds and hundreds of data items, and nobody knew whether a piece of information was relevant to them or not. Obviously, this is not ideal for a large extensible system. We don't want to have vast amounts of data, most of which is not relevant, because when we use any of those modules in another system, we have to provide all that extra information, or we have to unpick it from the debug info structure. So it's probably best avoided. Now we get into the good end of coupling, the lowest forms of coupling that we can have. Generally regarded as the best form of coupling is what is known as data coupling. That is, we don't ever directly expose state information, but what we do is we indirectly expose it. And the way we do that is through function calls. That is, we provide an interface. Even better is when we provide an interface that is in fact a service request. Rather than saying, I want you to change state or a demand to change state, you request a service. That request of service may cause a change of state in the server module. But now you are decoupled from whether that state change actually happens. You can pass arguments to that function to give it some indication of how it should change state. But there is no binding between the arguments necessarily and the state information that is stored inside the module. Now, normally to have proper data coupling, the arguments will be passed by copy and they will be elementary types, so built-in types in your language. I think we can go one stage further than this and extend this even further and actually talk about message coupling instead. In message uh, coupling, not only do we pass copies of the data and service requests to change state, but instead of directly connecting to the module, we use some storage mechanism, a queue or a buffer, and we decouple the request for service from the actual execution of the service. So that not only gives us a copy of state information, it also gives us temporal uh, separation between the two modules as well. That is the lowest form of coupling we can generally achieve if those two modules have to communicate at all. Obviously, the best form of coupling is to have the modules not communicate at all. We love this example in Feebas. Um, I present this quite commonly and I say to people, please comment on the coupling in this system. Or perhaps a better question should be, uh, please, would you like to test this system? The answer invariably comes back, uh, no, thank you. I would rather not. So what do we make of this system? 
we've got a number of modules. They all appear to be interconnected with everything else. Um, we could make the assumption that the people that designed this software clearly had no idea about architecture, no idea about intrinsic quality, no idea about good modular design. Although we could take a much more positive view of this and look at the actual system itself and say, hmm, this is a web server. That's quite a complex piece of software. And we have a PIC microcontroller, not a particularly powerful processor. So perhaps the engineers here have compromised on their flexibility because they have to get the performance of the system to an acceptable level. And this is one of the consequences of low coupling. The lower the coupling, the easier it is to extend a module, the more flexible it tends to be, the easier it is to test, but that comes at a price and that price is performance. If we look at our worst forms of coupling, like global variables, global variables are very fast. They are just simple reads and writes from memory. Whereas our lowest forms of coupling, asynchronous messaging, we have not only the memory required for copying state information, we also have a temporal separation between when the message is sent and when it is actually executed. That all takes time. The time becomes less predictable. So this is always a balance to be had between performance at one end of the scale and flexibility at the other. This raises a really important question, which is where should I pitch my coupling? Well, many people will tell you, you should make the system as fast as it can be. I would probably disagree with that. I would probably say you should make a system as fast as it needs to be to satisfy the customer today. If you make a system as performant as it can be, one, you are sacrificing flexibility to do so, and two, the customer won't give you any more money for this. In fact, they're more likely to come back to you shortly and say, we really love your system. Could you just make it a bit faster, please? If it's as fast as it can possibly be, you've got nowhere to go. My advice would therefore be bias your design towards flexibility, compromise it where you need to, and as minimally as you can. While we're looking at coupling, we need to have a look at a very related concept, which is the idea of encapsulation. Encapsulation literally means to seal inside a capsule. What does that mean in software terms? Well, some people say it means data hiding. That's, that's a, a reasonable thing to say, but I think a better definition of encapsulation is to separate implementation from interface and hide implementation detail. Implementation detail in this particular case not only means state information, but also means internal processing as well, algorithmic behavior. Why is this a beneficial thing to do? Well, if I cannot access your state information, your implementation, I cannot be coupled to it. I cannot be dependent upon it. Therefore, good encapsulation reduces the coupling in systems by literally making the coupling impossible. So we want to um, build our systems to be as encapsulated as we possibly can, because that will reduce the amount of coupling in the system. If I can reduce the amount of coupling, that makes my system easier to test. It also makes it more flexible from a project management point of view because the team developing the implementation do not need any dependencies to any other part of the system. It also gives us insulation from change. Any changes that happen to that implementation do not cascade outside of the boundary of the module. Therefore, no one else can be affected by them. Um, we can also consider composition a form of encapsulation, that is building objects or modules of other modules. In this particular case, we have a, a module called a sonar array. Our FFT analyzer and sweep frequency control clearly make use of the sonar array, but have no idea that there is a receiver interface and a transmitter drive inside them. This is sometimes known as the facade pattern. It's a great way of providing a interface over a set of potentially unrelated components.
We can now move on to the other important concept when we're looking at intrinsic quality. This is cohesion. If coupling is a, an external measure of the quality of our system, cohesion is about the internal quality of a particular module. Uh, more specifically, how the state information inside a module relates to the functionality that that module provides. The more the functionality in the module relates to the state information and vice versa, the higher the cohesion is. Once again, cohesion isn't an absolute, it's a spectrum. And the cohesion spectrum I feel is even more convoluted than the coupling spectrum. So we'll go through some of these things and I'll show you some examples of them. We desire the highest possible cohesion in a module. Why is that good? Because it means that things that change together stay together. The lowest possible cohesion we can have in a module means that change tends to be distributed throughout the system which means if something needs to change, there is more impact to that change. As with coupling, we'll start at the, the worst end of the scale and move towards good intrinsic quality. So we'll start at the worst possible form of cohesion we can have. It's known as coincidental cohesion. Technically, that means that no function has any relationship with any other function, and in fact, none of the functions share any particular state information. My personal favorite example of a module with very, very poor coincidental cohesion is the C standard library file, stdlib. This is a wonderful module if you want to explore how not to do cohesion. Let's look at some examples of things in there. This is just a, a subset. We've got the abort and at exit functions. So functions that are used to terminate the program. We have functions to turn ASCII characters into floating point integer and long types. And at the bottom, we have the conversions from strings to doubles, floats, and longs. We also have the memory allocation functions, malloc and free. We have random number generation. Oh, and the quicksort algorithm as well, and the system call code. What do these functions have in common? Uh, what does memory allocation have to do with random number generation? And what does random number generation have to do with sorting uh, structures? The answer is basically nothing. The only thing that binds those things together is they are all in stdlib.h. I suppose you could make a, a clever answer and say that many of these functions have to do with the runtime environment, but from a user's perspective, this is just random collections of functions. You have to know where they are. There is no help. Why is malloc, for example, not in the memory module? If any function demanded to be in there, it would be malloc and free. There we go. Let's move up the scale. Here is a module that many would argue is more cohesive. I've called it initialization. And we can clearly see that it initializes the motors, the sensors, the display, and the keypad in our system. What binds those things together is the purpose of the functions. They all happen to do initialization. So what's bad about this? What's bad about it is basically they don't share any state information at all. The only thing that they do is initialize. And in fact, the things that they initialize, their state information is probably distributed across many modules. So for example, the state information that represents one of the motors, for example, part of its state information is captured in here, part will be in another module, part of the state information will be in yet a third module, which means that should I change the actual physical motor in the system, all of that state information will have to be updated across many modules. That is, there is a propagation of change and a propagation of cost of change. This is not good. Here's another example of what is generally considered less good cohesion. It's known as temporal cohesion. Temporal cohesion is called that way because 
the operations in the module, although they um, have very little in the way of shared state, they all happen at the same time. The poster child for this is startup root, uh, routines, init routines. They tend to be a collection of unrelated functions that just happen to have to be called all at once. We can tend to think of um, functions with temporal cohesion as, if you like, controlling functions. That is, their purpose in life is to schedule and sequence things. That is a better view of temporal cohesion. Not great, but still better than having them distributed randomly across the system. Sort of related to that is the idea of procedural cohesion. Here's an example. We have an, an anti-lock braking system that consists of a number of pieces of functionality. So we've got measuring the wheel speed, measuring the tire pressure, and so on. It is compelling to put those into a module together, but the reason we're putting those together is because they happen to be used together. That is, there is some sequential information or sequential coupling between them. They all happen in particular sequence. So we put them all together. Once again, not necessarily terrible, but each of those pieces of functionality represents different parts of the system potentially. So we have state information that could still be distributed across the system. Consider what would happen if we wanted to reuse um, the dashboard display in another system. We would have to unpick all of its functionality from multiple different modules. Confusingly, we also have sequential um, cohesion, very commonly confused with procedural cohesion. In this particular case, the difference between sequential cohesion and procedural cohesion is in sequential cohesion, the output from one function is the input into the next. Here we have a closed loop controller. When we calculate an error, that error is used to be passed on to the next function in the chain. The output from calculating the drive signal is passed on to the next element in the chain. It is therefore not unreasonable to consider putting these all together in the same module. Once again, though, we get the same problem as we do with procedural cohesion. Getting better is the idea of communicational or informational cohesion. What is it that binds these functions together? Well, they all operate on the same set of data. In our case, it's our debug info structure from previously. However, there is very little functional relationship between printing debug information, searching debug information, copying debug information. And in fact, they share no internal state, those functions. They just happen to work on the same data set. But as you can see, we're, we're starting to get a more cohesive module. We're now at a point where we're starting to get to what would be considered good cohesion in a module. The generally best, in quotation marks there, form of cohesion is what is known as functional cohesion. Functional cohesion is where all of the functions in a module contribute to a single, well-defined task. Moreover, that single, well-defined set of functions that do a single task very commonly all operate on the same set of state information. What we're approaching here is really the idea of what objects are in an object-oriented design. We can consider an object as a set of related functions all operating on the same set of state data. Alternatively, to flip that around, objects are good for software management because they exhibit functional cohesion. And this is what we desire. This is the best form of cohesion. There is um, what some people call perfect cohesion. Um, I prefer the term atomic cohesion. The idea with atomic cohesion is those functions perform a single task and that task is irreducible. It cannot be broken down into smaller pieces. 
So in this particular example, we're dealing with simple functions like adding and subtracting fixed point mathematical representations. It makes no sense to break those down into smaller pieces. If we're going to talk about the relationship between functionality and state information, we need to talk about the concept of abstraction. Abstraction is known as the art of selective ignorance. I like using an analogy with the art world. What makes abstract art abstract? Um, I won't tell you what my favorite answer is. It's um, none too complimentary. But if you look at abstract art, the artist has said there is some aspect of the real world that I consider very important. There are other aspects of the world that I consider less important. So for example, it may be the color, it may be the shape, it may well be the emotional impact of that. The artist ignores the things that they are not interested in. So what does this mean for software design? Well, software is the act of abstraction. We are capturing information about the problem domain, about the customer's world. There are certain pieces of information about the real world that the customer is interested in. There are other pieces of information that they are not interested in. There are certain manipulations on that information that the customer is interested in. There are other manipulations that they are not interested in. Let's take some examples. Let's take a, a concept, the concept of an aircraft. Well, an aircraft is a real world thing. If I am an aerodynamics engineer, my purpose is to keep that plane flying straight and true. From my perspective then, an aircraft becomes an abstraction of thrust, weight, drag and lift. I must have more thrust than drag. I must have more lift than weight. Ideally as well, I want the force from the wings, the center of pressure, to act somewhere near the mass of the aircraft, the center of gravity of the aircraft. Otherwise I get undesirable characteristics. Everything else, like the number of passengers, the in-flight entertainment system, they are all irrelevant to me. If I'm an air traffic controller, I also use the term aircraft. But my problem is somewhat different now. My problem is I don't want two things called aircraft to be in the same place at the same time. So I actually have a four dimensional um, intersection problem to try and solve. To me then an aircraft is its identification, its position, including its altitude and where it's going. If I'm a baggage handler. I have the concept of an aircraft. I also have the concept of an identity, which may be the same information as an air traffic controllers. Um, I also have the concept of position. My idea of position as a baggage handler is very different though. It's only two dimensional. It's a stand and a time. And then there is other information like the loading mechanism and the capacity that has no relevance to any other problem domain. So I'm using the same term here, but I'm capturing different information. Why is this relevant? Well, a couple of things. Talking about the problem domain in problem domain terms is a much more effective way of understanding the customer's world and being able to express it in software. Ultimately, software is an expression, a codification of your knowledge about the problem domain and how it is supposed to work. So that's one reason why we should capture good abstractions. Secondly, and from an intrinsic quality point of view, problem domain abstractions tend to be very stable. The concepts of air traffic control or baggage handling tend to persi persist for a very long time. Things that persist unchanging for a long time are very good for the intrinsic quality of our software. They are tolerant to change. So ideally, what we want from our system then is good problem domain abstractions, highly cohesive modules, that is the functionality is tightly bound to the state information that it processes, and we want the minimal amount of communication between our modules. Where there is communication, we want it to be um, minimum amount of state change, minimum amount of state communication between modules.
That's what we would consider a good intrinsic design. Why is that good? Well, it gives us the software that is most flexible, most maintainable, most testable. What if I haven't got that already? What happens if I've got legacy code? Can I improve the intrinsic quality of my system? Well, let's take an example and see what we can do to improve code that already exists. Let's start with our worst possible case, but surprisingly uh, common in software, global variables. Global variables are evil. They are the highest form of coupling. This is the slide that we had earlier. And we have two modules interacting via a global variable. Can I improve this design? Well, the answer is yes, I can. I can refactor my design. But whenever I'm doing refactoring, I want to make small steps. At every stage, I want to make sure that my system is still correct. It still passes its tests. So let's do our first refactoring stage. All I've done is hidden the global variable behind an interface. I've provided a set of functions called get latest reading and set latest reading. What's the advantage of doing this? Well, if we look at the previous code, read temperature and get latest in degree C, now the information that they use is accessed via a function call. As a bare minimum, that now allows us to test those modules using test doubles, so mocks or stub objects, makes their testing a little bit more effective, easier to test. So that's stage one. Stage two is to refactor our code and refactor the control code so that control is encapsulated in one place. In this case, we've added a module called temperature sensor, and it provides a single function called read temperature in degree C. That does two things. It reads the temperature, and notice in this particular case, we are passing in state information via reference, what we call reference coupling. And then we are converting to degree C. In this case, just for variety, we are using copy coupling. We are passing in the information as a read-only parameter and receiving the result as a, an output parameter. Stage three, then, is to separate our code out and just provide a single module called temperature sensor that clients can use. Now our client isn't dependent on the sequencing of operation. They just get the result. Also note that I have separated out the actual hardware. My DS18B20 temperature sensor also provides an interface in the case of read temperature, which means that my temperature sensor code can now be tested in isolation using test doubles, for example, a mock temperature sensor to provide the read temperature functionality. So I've slowly decoupled myself from the global variable, and now I am down to data coupling between the client and the server. Another example of where we can improve coupling in our system, very commonly, we may have potentially very good cohesive modules. In this case, we have a motor module that connect, uh, captures all of the functionality to do with the motor in our system. So we can start it and stop it and check whether it's running. However, the state information is captured in a publicly accessible structure, my motor structure. The problem with this is the client can now change the state information of any particular motor object. We want to avoid that wherever possible because this gives us stamp coupling. The client can now be dependent on information that it doesn't really need to see. We need to improve the encapsulation of this system. One way to improve the encapsulation is to exploit something in C called an opaque type. C allows us to declare pointers to structures that it has not yet seen, incomplete types. We can put those pointers to incomplete types into header files and even pass them around as function parameters. This now gives us much stronger encapsulation. The client knows there is a pointer to a structure called motor. 
The client even knows there is a structure called motor, but the client cannot access that structure because it cannot see the declaration of it. What that means is we are free to change the implementation of that structure, the state information that's changed, without ever affecting the client code. We have provided insulation from change in this case. While we're talking about interfaces, uh, a very common feature of interfaces is replication of interface. Here we have some uh, SPI driver headers, SPI 0, 1, and 2. Uh, you can see by looking at this code that there is just replication of all the functions in the interface. The only thing that changes is the number of the uh, interface in this case. This is clearly not good from a maintenance point of view. There's a lot of replication of state information. There is a lot of replication of um, functionality. And actually, the client is now bound to concrete function calls. They will be bound to SPI2 uninitialized or SPI1 uninitialized. We can provide a lot more functionality by simulating the concept of interface. The interface in design terms is a contractual obligation between client and server. It provides an abstract set of behaviors that clients can depend upon and servers can provide. The way we simulate this in C is by providing a structure of pointers to functions. The client knows that it can call a function called uninitialize. The server can provide any implementation of that function it desires. Even better, that implementation can be rebound at runtime, giving us much, much more flexibility in our design. So we've gone from hard-coded interfaces, which are very rigid and inflexible, to a much more flexible solution using interfaces. What does this give us then in conclusion? Well, if we want to build systems that are flexible, we have a potential problem. We cannot just rely on correctness as part of as the system's fitness for purpose. As a bare minimum, our system must be correct. It must satisfy our customers. However, we desire systems that are flexible, maintainable, extensible, and testable. We need intrinsic quality. In order to achieve that, we have to design it into the system up front. The way we design that is building systems that are as tolerant to change as we can make them. To make systems that are tolerant to change, we want the lowest possible coupling in our system. That is the lowest amount of exchange of state information between modules as possible. One of the best ways to achieve that is through encapsulation. That is restricting access to state information to only controlled interfaces. What we also want is modules that exhibit high cohesion. That is, there must be a high dependency between the information in the module and the functionality of that module. The more the co more cohesive the module is, the more resistant to change it is, the more we limit the effect of change. A module that is cohesive, the changes happen in one place, wherever possible. And our cohesive modules are best when they represent problem domain abstractions, because they are generally long-term stable and allow us to communicate and build a system that expresses itself in problem domain terms. And the problem domain is likely to be more stable than others. That's a, a very brief overview of what is a very complex subject. So I thank you very much for your attention today. If you'd like to know more about this, um, please do go onto our website. We have a blog that discusses a lot of these articles, these issues in a lot more detail.